Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to the Pastor's Study. The question for this program is important. It is, is repentance necessary for salvation? That is, do I have to turn from my sin in order to be saved? Now, there are some in the church today who are teaching, no, because we're saved by grace alone, not by what we do, you can live in sin and go to heaven. In fact, there was a liberal Lutheran newspaper in the Twin Cities that has now folded, and I'm glad it did, because they would promote wrong points of view. And I'm a Lutheran, but here is what one commentator wrote. And this is before gay marriage was legal, and they were pushing for that. And he wrote this, Growing up in New York City, I was led to believe as a Lutheran, one is saved by believing in the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, by grace through faith, and that all sin is forgivable, Notice that all that was true except for this part. Whether one changes his or her behavior or not. In other words, as long as you believe in the Trinity, you can live like the devil and go to heaven. That's our question. Because we're saved by grace alone, can you live in sin and be saved? I want to tell you right up front my answer, then we're going to go through this. Yes, we're saved by grace alone, not by anything we do. Hallelujah. That's true. It's also true, you cannot live in impenitent sin and be saved. Let's see now how that can both be true. Let's pray. Father, we want to pray if there's someone watching this program and they're living in sin, maybe they're having sex outside of marriage or drunkenness or whatever it may be, Lord, we pray that you will shake that person to realize that you can't just say you believe in God. There needs to be true faith in Christ, true repentance, Speak to us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first point I want to make on this program is this. We are saved by God's grace. That means unearned favor. We are saved by God's grace, not by our good works. The Apostle Paul teaches this in Ephesians chapter 2. By grace, that's God's unearned favor, by grace you are saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not because of your good works, lest any man should boast. So when people think they're getting to heaven because they're good, they don't get it. And if you stop people on the street, 9 out of 10 people, well, do you think you're going to heaven? Well, I hope so. How do you think you get? Well, I think I've been good. That's not the way you get to heaven. I've shared this before on TV. Let me share it one more time. It'll make the point. Years ago in Omaha, a pastor shared this when I was a young Christian, and, and he said, my wife one day pushed me out the door and said, go across town and share the gospel with 80-year-old Ann Edith. Because she was a nice woman, but not a Christian woman. So the pastor said, drove across town, sat in her lovely living room, well, Ann Edith, my, my wife wants me to ask you a couple questions. Can I do that? Well, yes, Pastor. Well, if you died tonight, Ann Edith, are you sure you'd go to heaven? Well, I hope so. Pastor says you can know so. You can, the Bible says you can know where you're going to spend eternity. But let me ask you a question number two. If you died right now and God said, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? She came out with the number one wrong answer. I think I've been good because I'm basically a good person. I think God will let me into heaven. The pastor knew what to do. He said, okay, Ann Edith, let's see how good you are. I'm going to take you through the Ten Commandments. Don't answer out loud, but just in your own heart. Let me, let's see how you're doing. Commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Ann Edith, is God the most important thing in your life? Have you ever let your children, your grandchildren, your beautiful home, anything ever been more important to you than God? If so, you broke the first commandment. You deserve to go to hell. Commandment number two, um, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. 
You ever say, oh my God, oh Lord, you ever taken God's name in vain or Jesus' name in vain? If so, you broke the second commandment, you deserve to be punished. Commandment number three, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Do you go to church every week? Do you love to worship God and praise him every week? Or do you maybe make it Christmas and Easter? If so, you broke the third commandment. Commandment number four, honor your father and mother. Did you ever disobey your mom and dad when you were little? Commandment number five, thou shalt not kill. And he said, when he got to this one, she kind of breathed easy, but she, he pointed out, you know, the Bible says if you've ever hated someone in your heart, you've killed them. He took her through 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. By the time he got done with Aunt Edith, she knew she wasn't going to make it. And he said, are you really going to stand before God on Judgment Day and say, let me and I've been good? And she said, no, Pastor. And he said, where do you deserve to go when you die? And she said, hell pastor and the pastor said me too and he said because you can't get to heaven by being good because you're not because you can't get to heaven by keeping the ten commandments because you break them in thought word and deed more than you keep them god gave us a whole different way to be saved and he said to her would you like to know for sure when you die you go to heaven instead of hell and she said please and at that point he preached to her what's called the gospel the good news listen carefully here's the good news up here is heaven. Heaven is God's perfect home. If you want to get up into heaven, you have to be just like God is absolutely perfect. And let's say that my billfold here represents sin. God will not let sin get up into heaven. If he did, we'd have hatred, murder, crime, rape, abortion, pornography. It'd be America all over again. So God won't let any sin up into heaven. And this hand represents you and me, a typical human being. The problem is we're all loaded with sin. There's no way we're going into heaven in this condition. That's the bad news. Here's the gospel, the good news. 2,000 years ago, God came down from heaven and he became a human being. He took on a human being body, the baby Jesus in the manger. He lived on earth about 33 years, never sinned once because he was God. When he was 33 years old or so, he takes our sins off of us, puts them on his back. He carries our sins up to the cross. They put nails through his hands and feet. All the sins that we deserve to get punished for, he took our punishment for us. He paid for our sins. It killed him. He was buried. Our sins are buried with Christ. Three days later, he rises from the dead. He goes to heaven and he promises you, if you will turn to him and trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins, you will go to heaven when you die. The pastor said that 80-year-old Aunt Edith became a newborn babe in Christ that day. My first point for this message is, how do you get to heaven? Not by being good enough, because you'll never be good enough. It's only the grace of God. It's only what Jesus did on the cross that gets anybody into heaven. Second point today. You cannot live in impenitent sin and be saved. The same Apostle Paul who wrote Ephesians 2, were saved by grace alone, wrote this in 1 Corinthians 6. Do not be deceived. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor robbers, nor revilers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, Corinthians, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. In other words, you cannot live in sin impenitent sin and be saved. And you might say, well, but Pastor, uh, but Apostle Paul, you said in Ephesians 2 we're saved by grace and not by what we do. And here you're saying you have to repent to be saved. Well, here's what I think Paul would say. Yes, we're saved by grace alone and by nothing we do. But he would say, but grace never is alone. It always changes a human life. I will tell you, I went to a conference years ago, a pastor's conference. The, there was one line in the conference that was worth the admission for the whole thing. The pastor said, we are saved by grace alone, but grace never is alone. That is, it always changes your life, at least to a degree. You know, and, and so once you're saved by grace, it changes your life. Now, do Christians still sin? Of course we do, but we don't live in impenitent sin, and when we sin, we repent. I shared this before too, but here's my, here's my definition of a Christian. A man walks down the street, he slips and he falls in a mud puddle. 
He gets up, brushes himself off. He walks down the street, falls into another mud puddle. Gets up, brushes himself, walks on. That's a Christian. But man number two comes down the street. He slips and he falls in a mud puddle. He pitches his tent in the mud puddle. He lives the rest of his life in the mud puddle. I don't care how much he says the Apostles' Creed and believes in the Trinity, he has not been saved by the grace of God. Because when God saves you by his grace, you repent when you sin. And if there's no repentance, you haven't been saved by grace alone. I asked an old sailor, if I fall off the ship into that water there, will, that, will I drown? The old sailor says, no, falling into that water doesn't drown anybody. The guy says, well, then what does? And the old man said, staying there. If you've committed sins and you're sorry and you're trusting Christ, you're saved. But if you're living in it, your soul's in jeopardy. Here's a, a, a couple of years ago that said to me, you know, Pastor Brock, before we came to your church, we got married at a different Lutheran church. And at the premarital counseling time, I said to the pastor, well, you should probably know my girlfriend and I are living together. You know what the pastor said? Probably the best thing you can do to make sure you're compatible. In other words, you can live in fornication and go to heaven. That's not what 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says. So here's a, a young woman who was raised in the church that I served for many years. Comes up for communion uh, regularly. And then I hear she's living with her boyfriend. So I took her aside and we met and I said, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, fornicators don't go to heaven. You need to repent and ask God to forgive you for this. Well, she kept living with him and kept coming up for communion. Finally, I had to meet with her and say, you know, until you're ready to repent, I'm afraid you're going to hell if you die. You can't take communion until you repent of this sin. Years ago, I preached at a college and they had a Wednesday night folk service and so I preached against premarital sex. That week a young college woman comes in, sits down in my office and bursts into tears. Well past Tom, Tom uh, my boyfriend and I, yeah we are, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. She burst into tears, she prayed, she repented. We had a wonderful time in the Lord. And if I remember right, the same week her, her girlfriend came in uh, Pastor uh, Tom, I was at the folk service and I heard you preach against premarital sex. I said, yeah. Well, my boyfriend and I are in love. I don't think anything's wrong with this. And I, I took out 1 Corinthians 6. Well, let's see. Fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, when was that written? I said, oh, about 2,000 years ago. Well, times have changed. I said, have they? Let's look. Fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, I wouldn't budge, but neither would she. <laughs> Months later. She comes into my office, sits down, bursts into tears. My boyfriend told me to move out, etc. And she learned the hard way the truth of 1 Corinthians 6. My point is, you can't live in impenitent sin and be saved. And here is what is tragic. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the big liberal branch in Lutheranism, they have a partnered homosexual bishop now in California. The head of worship for the entire ELCA nationally is a pastor who has a male husband. In the United Church of Christ, the Presbyterian Church USA, the, United, uh, the uh, Episcopal Church in America, and now the Disciples of Christ and the ELCA, all these denominations have caved, and they teach you can be a practicing homosexual and be saved, not according to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. This is tragic. We have whole denominations now teaching you don't need to repent to be saved. <clears throat> I remember an old white-haired Lutheran pastor saying years ago, we are nicing people right into hell. Last point today. Beware of grace abuse. Grace abuse goes like this. Because we're saved by grace alone and not by what we do, I can sin all I want because we're saved by grace alone. Let me tell you the worst example I've ever heard of grace abuse. Years ago, when I was still in the liberal ELCA Lutheran Church, I heard that the Lutheran Hospital in Portland, Oregon, was performing abortions. I wrote the Bishop of Oregon. I said, how can we as a Lutheran hospital kill unborn children? He responded, we can do this because the Lutheran Church believes in the grace of God. Did you catch that? 
Because we believe in grace, kill your unborn baby? This is evil. This is called grace abuse. And even an evangelical pastor that I respect, I saw him preaching on TV, and he taught, well, if you accept Christ, and then you turn away and you live in impenitent sin, you'll still go to heaven because 20 year early, years earlier you accepted Christ. That's not what the Apostle Paul teaches. Yes, we're saved by grace alone, but if you're living in sin, you don't have grace in your life. Paul, here's what Paul said to grace abuse. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? Paul's answer, may it never be. How shall we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized in death uh, that we might walk in newness of life? So, now we're coming to the end and here's where I'm trying to put it together. Here we go. You could say, well, then aren't you teaching there is something you do to save yourself? You repent. So aren't you contradicting salvation by grace alone? No, follow this. Repentance is not something I do. It's something the Holy Spirit does in my heart. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. That includes faith. That includes repentance. So because the Holy Spirit is the one who produces repentance in me and faith in Christ in me, he gets the credit for all that. So salvation is still 100% the grace of God. And let me tell you where I get this. this uh, in Acts chapter 11, uh, the apostles are preaching how the Gentiles got saved. And the people marvel and they say, well, then God has granted the repentance to life to the Gentiles. Repentance is something God grants. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writes to young Timothy, correct your opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them the repentance that leads uh, to the knowledge of the truth. So if you're sorry for your sins, you believe in Christ, that's not something you did. <laughs> Apart from me, Jesus said you can do nothing. So the Holy Spirit gets credit for your salvation, your repentance, your faith. It's all by grace you're saved, not by works. So, let me just close with this. I was getting on the airplane to fly to Europe. It's like an eight-hour flight. This is a few, some years ago. I always pray before I get on the plane, Lord, put me next to somebody. And no, the, the plane was full except for the seat next to mine. It was empty. And I'm, I'm kind of easy on that because I love to lay out for eight hours. And so they closed the door. The plane's about to take off, and then they did something I've never seen before. They said, oh, I'm sorry, we've got to open the door back up. Somebody's running late from another flight. And so they opened it up. This very tall, thin guy runs, sits down next to me. Plane takes off, and he lives with a man in Amsterdam. He's a homosexual. He has AIDS, and we had quite the talk. And he finds out I'm a pastor, and he says, well, I'm a Christian too. And then he talks about his homosexual lifestyle. And, and finally, and it was very hard to bring it up, finally I said, you know, let me ask you something. And I told him, I've struggled with same-sex attraction most of my life. But for the sake of Christ and my soul, I say no to that. I said to him, do you ever struggle with the fact that you say you're a Christian, but you're living in a sin that 1 Corinthians 6 says is going to keep you out of heaven? Well, you could tell when I asked the question, he did not like it. He got very quiet. And, you know, finally he said, well, I know that came from your heart. Thank you. I'll think on that. But, you know, then he, uh, the plane flight got over and whoever knows what he did with it. But listen, I'm what, if you are right now living in any kind of sin, you're, an, you're, you're a drunkard, you're a fornicator with your girlfriend, you're a homosexual, you're a robber, you're a violer, you read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, and then realize we're saved by grace alone, but you have to repent to be saved. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor's study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us his knowledge of Scripture and his insights to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. Pastor Brock, in light of your sermon, will God forgive someone if they commit the same sin over and over again? And Jackie, my response to that is, I sure hope so. Because, <laughs> I mean, unless people are made out of different stuff than I am, haven't we all committed a certain sin more than once? 
And Jesus said to Peter, no, Peter said to Jesus, Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Seven times a, a day? Jesus said, not seven times a day, 70 times seven. In other words, I have to forgive you 490 times a day, Jackie. And if I'm supposed to do that for you, don't you think God's doing more than that for yes. us? Yes. You know? So my point is, I just preach you can't live in impenitent sin and be saved. But I also want to say, when you sin, if you truly repent, you're forgiven. Okay, what happens if a person dies without time to confess their sins? You know, I, this is something I, I often will say to a confirmation group. You know, two Christians are in a car. They get in a heated argument. One c curses God's name and says GDU, and the other says, well, GDU, and boom, they get hit by a bus and killed. Neither had time for forgiveness. I said to them, confirmation students, did they go to heaven or hell? Well, they went to hell. Why? Well, they didn't have time to confess their sins. And I will say, so my salvation depends on me having had time to confess all my sins. Well, yes. I said, then nobody's going to heaven. You don't know half your sins. And everybody will die without having had time to confess their sins. What saves us is Christ on the cross, not whether I have enough time. Okay. You taught that there is nothing we can do to be saved. Mm -hmm. I guess my question is, don't you have to believe in order to be mm -hmm. saved? You have to repent to be saved. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus to be saved. Um, but in the same, it, they asked Paul in Acts 16, what, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says to the jailer, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. So you have to do that. But later in the book, or actually earlier in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 13, the apostles are preaching. And it says, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So yes, you have to believe in Christ to be saved, but only those who are appointed, first off, predestination, the Holy Spirit creates faith in their heart. You do have to believe to be saved, but that's something the Holy Spirit does in you. You can't do that on your own. It says in the book of Acts, the Lord li opened Lydia's heart to receive the things said by Paul. Okay, Pastor Brock, we have a Christian woman who watches our show, mm -hmm. and she's been invited to a lesbian niece's wedding. And her question for you is, should she go? Mm -hmm. I've struggled with same-sex attraction most of my life. I'm not going to go the route of homosexual behavior or getting a boyfriend. I won't do that. I don't, I rather am selfish, Jackie. I'd rather spend eternity in heaven, thank you very much. So if I had a niece who's a lesbian, want me to go to her wedding, I might lovingly write her a little note or I'll give her a phone call or meet with her. Uh, darling, you know, I love you, but because of the Bible's teaching that God doesn't want you to get into that behavior, I can't support that, so I won't be attending the wedding. That's what I would do. You don't want to support something that's going to land somebody in the wrong place in eternity. Isn't it funny how we always worry so much about hurting the feelings of family and things like that? and not have the courage to stand up yeah. for why we're yeah. saying the things we're saying? And what are we going to say on Judgment Day when people on their way to hell turn over their shoulder and say to us, why didn't you warn me, you know? Yeah. Huh. So is it proper to say that we're saved by grace and good works then? No, you don't want to say that because okay. you'll never know if you're saved. If I'm saved by God's grace and my good works, well, then have I got enough good works added to grace to save me? And the whole book of Galatians is a big no to that. We're saved by grace alone, not by circumcision, not by this. But, and, and Romans 3 says, Paul writes, we hold that a person is justified. That means declared not guilty before God. We hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So only grace saves, not grace plus my good works. But it's also true when you're saved by grace, it does change your life. You won't be perfect, but when you do sin, you repent. I think, too, when you're saved by grace, that gives you the zeal to want to do yeah. good works yeah. to, yeah. you know, and to help people with right. things. If you, if, Jackie, if you read Psalm 51, David, the only person in the Bible of whom it says he was a man after God's own heart, commits murder and adultery. And then he writes Psalm 51 where he bewails his sinfulness. I think Christians are... It's possible for a great Christian to do a horrible sin, but the way you're going to know if he's a Christian is does he horribly repent, hugely repent afterwards. That's the mark of a Christian. You know, I never thought about that, but, you know, it's true. If God could forgive David, David yeah, he could forgive me. 
that's right. You know, that's a good thought for yeah. people in Psalm this day 51. and age. Yeah. Huh. Um, one of our right listeners wrote in that she has a friend that says she doesn't know for sure she's saved. But the friend, is this being arrogant? Doesn't only God know who's yeah. saved? Sometimes you hear, I mean, Jackie, I know I'm going to heaven when I die. Now, isn't that arrogant? Well, no, because it doesn't depend on me. <laughs> the reason I know I'm going to heaven is not because Tom Brock deserves it, because he doesn't. The reason I know I'm going to heaven is Christ died for me, and the promise of God, and he doesn't break his promise, there's a number of promises in the New Testament. Believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved, your sins are forgiven. So our assurance is based on Christ, not on me. All right, so the question from this lady, though, this woman or person, you know, she's the arrogant one, I think, rather than thinking yeah. it's, you know. I, I agree. <laughs> to say so, that you know more God than God and God's not going to keep his promises, that's kind of arrogant. Yeah. Um, you know, why is it we have so much trouble, though, confessing our sins? And, I mean, we, you know, you say these little confessional things like before communion and that, mm -hmm. but personally confessing, I think is really difficult and trying on yeah. people. There are two kinds of Christians, Jackie. Those who confess their sins too much because okay. they're guilt-ridden. <laughs> and then there are Christians who just can do, you know, when Christians say, oh my God, I'm thinking, wait a minute, do you ever ask for forgiveness for that? Do you realize that? So some Christians feel too much guilt, some too little. I think the balance is to be in Scripture and to be in a good Bible preaching church. Well, we only have 30 seconds left, and we want to tell you that we wouldn't be on the air if it wasn't for the listeners that are out there watching at their home or wherever they're watching. We really appreciate your prayers and your gifts of money to help promote this uh, ministry. And we just pray that God would be with each and every one of you this week, granting you his richest blessings until we're all together again next time. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always.